Right, welcome everyone to the final seminar of the winter quarter CBDRL seminar series. We are delighted to have Bruce Jones with us today, who is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and director of its projects on international order and strategy. He previously served as vice president and director of foreign policy studies at Brookings and is a consulting professor at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. He's the author or co-author of several books on international order and has extensive experience in intervention and crisis management, as well as multilateral institutions, having worked at or advised the United Nations, the World Bank, and the State Department. His most recent book is To Rule the Waves, How Control of the World's Oceans Shapes the Fate of the Superpowers, and that is what he will be discussing today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I was saying to Steve Stedman that I realized as I came into the room that the last time I gave a seminar in this room was 1997. Oh, wow. A lot older than I normally do today. So it's been a while. I think I've lectured in every room in FSI, but it's been a while since I've done this one. So I know it's delightful to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. I know that issues of sea power and China are not what's on everybody's minds. What's on everybody's minds are issues of land power and Russia and Europe. I'm not going to talk at all about those things. But I do think that there is a connection because we can debate and discuss this, but it does seem to me that it's highly likely that Russia's scale of ambition is tied to its own sense of top cover in Beijing and that Beijing in its own terms and in very different ways has shifted toward the strategy of challenging the West uh, in terms of international order. Uh, or as I argue in the book, in terms of counter hegemony, but a challenge to the West. And the last, it creates a space in which Putin's adventurism takes place. Um, I realized that we gave this title, this was a few weeks ago, we gave this title a talk, New Cold War at Sea. We should just stop with New Cold War. But I am going to talk about what it is that has led to, or at least contributed to, China's sense of the need to challenge the United States in terms of counter hegemony. It's not where I started on the book. I would have been an empiricist by instinct more than a theorist. So working at Brookings, working foreign policy in Washington, I found myself, I was working on geopolitical issues, I was working on climate change, energy issues, I was working on globalization. And I kept on finding myself working on and talking about the oceans. Uh, I've done some work on the Arctic, did some work on piracy. I kept on coming back to this business of the oceans. And so I started reading more about the role of navies, the role of sea power and the nature of international order. And this, this realization, um, I'm not the first to make this observation by any means, but they're reading into this realization that over the last several centuries, that state empire entity, which has been most able to uh, project power globally has been that which is fueled the world's dominant navy, um, dating back to the Portuguese and their entry into Europe in the 1500s. And it's a kind of doubly ironic moment in history when that happens, because you have Portugal, which is Europe's smallest empire at the time, its furthest West empire. Uh, and lots of European adventurers have tried to find a, a route into the Indian Ocean, a route to the Orient and failed. And it's the Portuguese, it's got the Portuguese who eventually do it, because it turns out you have to sail quite a bit further west into the Atlantic than people realized to catch the trade winds down around the Cape of Good Hope and up into the Indian Ocean. So it's ironic that it's this westernmost part of Europe that finds the route to Asia, but it's, what's even more ironic is that they enter Asia's waters at a point in history where China, for completely different reasons, has withdrawn its maritime capacity. Right? If you go back to the mid 1400s and you look at the the maritime weight of China, if you look at the sophistication of their, of their ships, it's vastly superior to anything that Europe is able to field uh, for a couple of centuries uh, to follow, right? Um, the largest ship in the Chinese fleet under Admiral Zhang He, who was the kind of famous uh, sort of advocate of Chinese naval power, was roughly six times larger than the largest fleet in the Europe, the ship in the European fleet. Of um, later, I write about this in the book, one of these kind of funny connections between trade and economics and history. Uh, when Benjamin Franklin was postmaster general in London in the mid 1700s, this is just before independence, he's working with the British, and he's watching the voyage of uh, mail packets back and forth across the Atlantic and realizes that the packets sailing from Boston get to London faster than the ones going from London to Boston. And 
realizes that seems odd and begins to do some work and it's basically the foundational science of oceanography, the kind of charting of the ocean currents is done by Benjamin Franklin. And he gets fascinated by these oceanographic issues and he spends some time writing about ship design and hull design. And one of the things he writes about is how sophisticated was the hull design of the Chinese maritime fleet in the 1400s. And later in the book, we'll come to it, uh, revolution in global shipping trade uh, made possible in part by much larger, much more sophisticated hulls using Ben Franklin's notes about Chinese hulls from the 1400s. And so a very sophisticated fleet. They pull out of the high seas in the, in the 1400s, just before the arrival of the Europeans. And Europe is able to dominate Asia in the ensuing centuries, in part, in large part, because of its superior naval capacity, right? And that also takes us through the British period in East India Company and then the Royal Navy and the entry into India. And then very consequentially, the entry into China and the remaking of global trade around opium sales and the like in China. It is sort of striking to go back and realize that Britain is Britain was the world's largest, history's largest drug dealer, a uh, big sort of part of what has shaped the modern world. It's also striking, I don't know how many of you have read the articles of the GAT, WTO. I don't recommend you do so, They're very boring, uh, <laughs> but I have. And the core provisions of the WTO are word for word identical to the terms that the British negotiated as they used the Navy to force their way into China in the 1850s. Uh, to sell opium, the first opium war and the second opium war, uh, which were concluded in what the Chinese call the unequal treaties, the uh, Treaty of Vogue and Treaty of Nanking, which set out the provisions of most favored nation, extraterritoriality, things which have become a standard part of contemporary globalization, are actually forged at the, at the end of a British gunship in the 1850s. Um, I also like to remind folks when I'm talking about this that Britain wasn't the only power that forced its way into China to sell opium in those days. We did too. Uh, these days, it's sort of you know, current to talk about the kind of long running war in Afghanistan or the much longer presence we've had in Korea. Actually, the largest running overseas engagement we've ever had. We had an American fleet stationed out of Hong Kong uh, and sailing ships up and down the Yangtze River for 98 years, included just before the, end of the start of the Second World War. Uh, and we had sort of penetration up and down the main trade pathways of of China for nearly 100 years. Okay. Uh, fought in the Boxer Rebellion, six nations that fought to suppress a rebellion against the Chinese state when they tried to cut off opium sales. We participated in that campaign. I, I reminded these people of these things because I think these issues are not forgotten in Chinese memory of the West. Right? The fact of having been forced to free trade at the end of a British gunship, the fact of the American participation in the Imperial invasion around the Boxer Rebellion, these things are not absent from Chinese things. Anyway. Uh, 500 years of the world's dominant power being that entity which uh, wields the largest navy, the Royal Navy obviously having that for the longest period of time, takes us through the First World War. We come out of the First World War with the world's largest navy, but of course, as many other people have written about, do not then choose to project ourselves in a kind of powerful way in that post-war period. The British Navy continues to dominate Pisces until the Second World War. We'll skip lightly over the history of the Second World War. You all know that. Uh, role of Navy quite important. Then it seems to me that if we look at this in strategic terms, as we end the Second World War and we enter into the Cold War, issues naval recede somewhat in strategic terms. They're not entirely unimportant. By the 60s, we're in a naval arms race with the Soviets, role of submarines in the nuclear triad, you know, quite important, et cetera. But naval affairs are not front and center in our competition with the Soviets. I mean, it's often the historical phenomenon of our forward land presence in, in both Europe and Asia, and obviously nuclear missiles and air power take over. But it's exactly at that point of time that oceans are about to play a really significant role in a totally different domain of life, namely trade. And this comes about in a strange way. So I'm going to just, I'm a big believer in the old adage, the power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I will show you a couple of photographs and, and maps, or I will try, oh, there we go. Um, I went back and I looked at trade patterns in the 1950s. This is a CIA map of, of agricultural trade. It, this varies a little bit from product to product, but it doesn't vary, doesn't vary very much. 
And what you see if you look at global trade in those days is huge flows from Latin America up into the United States and huge flows from, from Africa up into Europe. Right? So it's flows from the global south up into the two industrial centers uh, of the time, Europe and the United States. That's global trade today. Okay? A little different. Uh, and this remaking of global trade, the, the emergence of modern globalization. I think we hear the word globalization, we think of high tech, we think of airplanes, we think of personnel flows. 85% of the world's of the value of global trade moves by sea okay? along those routes. Uh, this is every ship in the world. As of the day I published the book, Moving Trade uh, Globally. It's a little bit distorted if you look at the way uh, I just showed you, by the way, because if you measure by value, that's what it looks like. And essentially what we're talking about is vast flows from the east and west coast of the United States into Europe uh, and then through the Suez and the Malacca Straits uh, up into East Asia, right? So it's trade by value connecting the three industrial centers of our time. Europe, the United States, and East Asia with minor flows to other places, okay? Uh, this comes about in huge part because of a change which is so small, so trivial, and so obvious in retrospect that it's hard to understand how consequential it was. And it starts with an innovation by an American trucking entrepreneur called McLean, okay? And he's got his trucks, he's moving goods up and down the East Coast of the United States. And he's getting super frustrated. He's got his goods in the back of a truck. And he you know, drives into the port of Jersey and he has to wait for several days until stevedores will take a variety of forms of boxes off the back of his truck, leave them on the wharf. Several more days pass, stevedores will load it onto a ship, sell it up to Baltimore or whatever. Stevedores unload, wait in the docks several more days, load it onto his truck. He's like, well, this is ridiculous. What if I just drive my truck onto the ship? So he does, he drives the truck onto the ship, sails up to Baltimore. And he realizes, hold on a second, can't use my ship while it's on the truck, so that doesn't make sense. So what if I just take the back part of my truck off and just drop it on the ship? And he does that. And then he realizes, well, okay, but it doesn't fit very well, but what if I retrofit a ship to be able to do this? And he does, and he retrofits the ship, it's called the Ideal X. And he sails that ship, he loads a bunch of trucks, he loads 56 trucks worth of goods, and sails it from Jersey up to Baltimore takes his crops up, picks them up the other day. And it's the first ever containerized ship, okay? 56 containers. Uh, and what happens next is slowly, ports begin to see the potential value of this. Stevedore unions are weakened. Trade regulations are negotiated over. And slowly, you start to see the growth in a transatlantic sea-based trade, a move between East Coast ports Rotterdam and London, which are early to containerize. Uh, and you see this huge spike upwards in trade between the United States uh, and Europe. I mean, it's a one-for-one -one relationship between the scale of shipping, the scale of trade, and growth in the global economy, all right? And that's essentially uh, a transatlantic trade in the 60s and into the 70s, right? Then two things happen, Korean War and the Vietnamese War. And with the Korean War and the Vietnamese War, the United States needs to move huge amounts of material over to East Asia to prosecute those wars. So how does the duck do it? By adopting the same technology the Army calls connexes, container boxes, and builds the container shipping frameworks and ports all over East Asia to supply the war effort first in Korea and then later in Vietnam. Uh, and the ships continue to grow in size, the trade continues to grow inside, the global economy continues to grow inside, and the, the availability of these ports is part of what allows what we later refer to as the Asian tigers to enter into globalization and to kind of expand trade across the, across the Pacific. Um, the first major study of this is by a guy called Mark Levinson, who wrote a book in the early 90s called The Box, writing about the impact of containerized shipping on trade. And at the time, he's writing about this huge transformation in the scale of shipping and therefore of trade, argues that it, the innovations in shipping scale are the single biggest driver in cost reduction and trade. Makes the point that if you take a bunch of t-shirts, make them in Laos, which is where most t-shirts are made, uh, and get them to a port someplace in Vietnam, load it into a, a ship, you know, connect to a Chinese ship or something, it's gonna sail across to, to New York and then get them to Macy's in New York, that per unit, per t-shirt, it's cheaper to do that than to make the t-shirt in 
the you know the the kind of fabrics part of New York City and drive it up by truck. Like it just reduces the cost of, of transportation of goods to an astonishing degree. And at the time, he's writing about these mammoth ships that have transformed global trade. And the largest ship at the time uh, is able to hold four thousand containers. Okay. So during the research for the book, I arranged to go on just me at the front of the containers. <laughs> Okay. Oh man. A little bit of sense. Okay. 26,000, uh, sorry, 20,526 containers on that ship. Right. Uh, in this community, we're used to thinking about aircraft carriers as big ships. You can take two of the USS Nimitz, drop it into the size of the Midland Barracks, and have room left over for the Empire State Building. It's a big ship. Right. Um, the founder of this company, Maersk, largest shipping company in the world, started uh, doing sort of sailing um, trade ships up and down the Baltics, copper, beer, nails, wheat kind of thing. We sailed around and traded with the Russians in the, in the Baltic seas in those days. And his ship was able to hold in its cargo roughly the equivalent of 26 containers of modern measurement ships. He sailed that ship with 27 crew. That ship sails with a crew of 14. Okay. It's just this fantastical revolution in the efficiency of trade. And it basically just dramatically reduces, this is sea freight, okay? just dramatically reduces the cost of shipping things around the world and transforms the economics of globalization. Okay? Uh, there are two deep consequences of that that I talked about in the book. One is for us. Um, you go back to the 1970s when this is just beginning to take off. The United States is about 8% dependent on global trade as a share of GDP. Right? Very, very low by modern industrial standards, but about 8% dependent. As sea based shipping explodes in the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, that number changes, and we're about 30% dependent on global trade. Uh, as presenter to GDP now. But what I argue in the book is that it actually significantly underestimates uh, our exposure to global trade and our economic exposure to global trade because the other thing that's happening in that same period is the financialization of the American economy, right? Uh, the year I wrote the book, 50% of profits recorded by any firm in the United States were recorded in the financial sector. That's pretty big, right? Those people are not financing American industry. They're financing global trade. Right? We are the bankers of global trade and the investment flows that come out of it, but, but that kind of massive growth in globalization, sea-based globalization, is a big part of what transforms our financial sector as well as our economy as a whole. I think very consequentially in terms of what we know now about globalization and its impact in the United States and what that's meant politically. Uh, by the way, numerically, you can look at this. It's hugely profitable for us in terms of jobs gained, about three times more jobs gained by this than jobs lost. That's, of course, a different story than what happens politically. All of this, all of these things are concentrated in 10 ports around the United States that happen to also be the 10 centers of finance around the United States, which also happen to be the 10 largest urban centers. Right? So there's a, a huge concentration of wealth around the servicing of global trade, uh, which reinforces the dynamics that we know about in the United States. There's another country that is transformed by sea-based trade. Okay? This is Yongshan Port, south of Shanghai. Uh, he was asking me earlier if I was going to comment on, I mean, you guys were all sitting here watching last, the last couple of years, last year or so, all these container ships stalled in the port of LA Long Beach, right? A relatively minor disruption in global supply chains, uh, which huge ripple effects across US inflation rates and supply, and et cetera. We all tried to find bicycles and whatever else we were trying to find that we couldn't find. They're all stuck. LA Long Beach. <coughs> moves 8 million containers a year, the largest port in the West. 42 million containers a year in Yongsha. And you see this just phenomenal change in the nature of China's role in trade if you look at port development over the last couple of decades. Go back to the 1980s again, and you look at the top ports in the world, who's moving those containers in the world, and it's New York, it's Rotterdam, it's London, you know, it's all the kind of places you'd expect. Plus, uh, um, I can't remember the port outside of Tokyo and Busan, which was created for the Korean War. Singapore as well. Singapore early on figures out this game and enters 
globalization. And one other port that enters early, early on recognizes the importance of containerization and completely transforms its port. It's the first port in the world to just go fully containerized, which is Hong Kong. And remember, at the time, Hong Kong is British and it's the West's Asian outport, outpost, right? It's the West port in, in Asia and becomes a major hub for globalization, both trade, finance, et cetera. And then of course, end of the Cold War, opening to China, and Hong Kong reverts to, to China. At the time India's beginning to liberalize, Brazil's beginning to liberalize, lots of places are beginning to liberalize. China's beginning to liberalize. The transfer of Hong Kong back into China. I liken it to, you know, imagine there's a family business and there are four children that sort of decide to break off from the business and sort of go out on their own and see which one will can succeed and as an entrepreneur. And then one of them inherits the world's largest merchant bank. <laughs> well, guess which one's gonna do well, right? And China, just as it's beginning to, just as it's entering WTO, just as it's beginning to really open, has this fantastically large asset, uh, which returns to it and jumps ahead in sort of global trade dynamics, okay? Fast forward to the present day, 42 million containers a year moved out of the Yongchang. The next five largest ports in the world are all in China. So China just takes this kind of extraordinarily large role in trade, much more so than when you look at it in terms of relative GDP. So if you look at it in terms of trade, vastly more so. Okay. So what on earth does any of this have to do with international order or Ukraine? What it has to do with is what happens in Chinese strategic thinking as you begin to understand how dependent they are on the flow of these ships in and out of their ports. All right. Um, at independence, sorry, sorry the, you know, the communist takeover in, in 47, having done the long march, um, I was long march, China adopts a strategic concept usually referred to as deep in land defense, relatively weak nation state, repeatedly invaded through time, a sense that if invaded again, it can simply withdraw back into its territory and exhaust invaders as it moves across deep inland territory. As it becomes more confident in the 70s, shifts to a coastal defense strategy, which is pretty self-explanatory, stop an invasion of the coast. But then it begins to understand how profoundly dependent it is on the flow of goods in and out of, this is the Western Pacific, where the rest of the talking, we'll be talking about the Western Pacific, everything west of Hawaii, uh, and then to China's eastern waters, okay? So this is China in the 1990s, 2000s, 2000s, and 10s, beginning to grow very quickly. And China has three major economic zones. Outside of Beijing, spreading out to the Yellow Sea, in Shanghai, spreading out to the East China Sea, and in Guangzhou, Hong Kong, spreading out to the South China Sea, okay? And these container ships are moving in and out of these things at vast volume as are oil tankers and gas tankers and wheat tankers and everything else is in bulk shipping in every facet of the global economy moving in and out of these waters, right? But who controls those waters? We do. U.S. Navy has dominated those waters since the end of the Cold War. And it sets off a debate inside Beijing about whether to continue to free ride on U.S. naval power. The United States Navy has sort of adopted the role of guaranteeing, of being the guarantor of the flow of free trade, uh, freedom of navigation and all good stuff. You know, should we continue to free ride in the US Navy? Or is it worrying that our trade is uh, guaranteed by the US Navy and sort of the US Navy controls those waters and, you know, like choke them off as it did to the Japanese during the Second World War, for example, right? Not maybe helped by the fact that in the US context in DC, lots of people in Pentagon start writing articles about how to choke off Chinese trade and a variety of scenarios, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's Washington, so we write this stuff in public. <laughs> Working reports and CSS reports and proceedings journals. It's like, well, we wouldn't be able to choke it up there, but we could do it there. <laughs> it's like, well, the Chinese read this stuff. <laughs> the Chinese begin to get very nervous about their exposure to, to the US Navy and the kind of the ability to choke off. At this point, it's 70% of Chinese GDP is flowing in through these ports. Okay. Pretty vast exposure. And so they begin to develop what they call the concept of near seas defense, the ability to stop us from choking off the flow of trade in the Yellow Sea, East China Sea, and the South China Sea. Just so happens, by the way, that between those two bodies of the waters of the Taiwan Strait, we'll come back to that. Okay, a little, little detail. Um, but 
I do really think that when you look at Chinese strategic thinking at that time, their primary preoccupation is their vulnerability to our naval power uh, and the, our ability to choke off this vital, I and mean, it's not just the artery, it's the entire blood system flowing into the Chinese economy. Right? So begin to develop a near sea defense. And just as you have people in Washington saying, well, we could choke it off or whatever, you also have people saying, well, hold on a second. I mean, they're dependent on free flow of global trade. We're pretty dependent on the free flow of global trade. Maybe we can coexist at sea here, right? Uh, and at the same time, it's roughly the same time in the Indian Ocean out here, you start to see a huge spike in the world's second oldest profession, namely piracy, right? Uh, and as sea-based trade takes off uh, across the Indian Ocean in the 2000s, so does piracy. And you start to see this just spike after spike after spike in piracy against shipping in the Indian Ocean. And the United States, surprisingly, leads the global effort to respond, brings NATO along with it, brings the EU along with it, and mounts a coalitional effort in the Indian Ocean, which has among its members China, Russia, uh, and also India, Brazil, and France. And for a period of time, China and Russia are actually sailing under NATO coordination in the Indian Ocean under what's called the shade mechanism, shared awareness and deconstruction. Okay, so. And it just reinforces the sense in DC that you know maybe after all, or at least in one part of DC, that maybe after all we can coexist in the high seas, we can co-control. That mindset in Beijing and in Washington, in my estimate, lasts for around three years. And then just begins to collapse. And it collapses for a range of reasons to do with Chinese internal dynamics and Washington's internal dynamics, but a big part of what happens is two changes in the respective naval communities. On the Chinese side, having begun to seriously build out their capabilities here, which is both naval capability and these huge land claims you all know about in 2009, they make this vast claim to, I call it a land, but sea claim, a vast claim under the, the law of the CD2 sovereignty in the, um, this line here. Uh, they make a huge play for the resources, the oil, the gas, the fish in those waters. They also claim sovereignty over a whole bunch of bits of sand uh, that are dotted around those, those waters. It's a very shallow sea, by the way. Uh, the ocean, the passages you can sail in a big ship are very narrow. The rest of the sea is sort of dotted with these land formations, et cetera, shores. How do they make that claim? I mean, why is that area? So this is actually, it's not quite their claim, but it's pretty close. So they, they went and they found these little islands all through here where they could find evidence of a Chinese fisherman having been there at one point in the 1500s or something. They said, look, it's Chinese national territory. Some places they put some bird watching stations in, they put a saddle, uh, a weather monitoring someplace and they just claimed them. And they filed a claim under the unconventional law of the sea. Lots of people have made counterclaims, arbitration, but they just claim. <laughs> um, uh, so they're building out their navy, but they also begin to do two things that are really consequential in those waters. They begin to fortify and militarize those land features, right? building out what are amount to bases in those waters, and those bases in those waters. Michael Hanlon calls them stationary aircraft carriers. I don't know if that's a good image or not. Mm -hmm. And they begin to develop significant missile capacity to deter us from reinforcing our presence in those waters. And they adopt a new concept called far seas defense, which is exactly what it sounds like, right? Having built up a capacity to defend themselves here, classic sort of security dynamic, now they have to worry about, well, our capacity to override those defenses and they realize, well, the, A, they have a security reason, B, trade reasons to go much farther out. And they articulate a far seas defense concept uh, which involves the Arctic, the further reaches of the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. And they developed what they call a counterinsurgency doctrine, great name, which is a doctrine for the development of weapon systems that would stop us from being able to reinforce our capabilities, you know, sailing assets in from Hawaii and Guam through the Luzon Strait into these waters. And they begin to develop this off capacity uh, to do that. Um, I spent some time for the book on this. This is the USS John Paul Jones. <laughs> it's 37 years old. It's the most advanced ship in the American fleet. Those are both true statements. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it has America's most advanced ballistic missile defense radar and missile systems. Um, and I emphasize this because 
uh, when I talk about this kind of, oh, I, I, let me, before I do this, let me just back up one second. China is developing a Farsi's capability, right? Farsi's concept. The United States is still grappling with this question of whether or not what we're watching is the beginnings of a Chinese blue water Navy and a hegemonic aspiration, or if this is really just about the protection of globalization and trade, at which point we should be able to coexist. And I spent in 2018, 17, 18, 19, I spent a lot of time sitting in on US Navy War College and uh, US Navy debates around this kind of stuff. Now, some of you will remember uh, <clears throat> turn of the century, 19. 1905, something along those lines. Germany starts to build out its naval capacity. At the time, Britain has the world's largest naval capacity, and Germany starts to build out its naval capacity. And the Foreign Office asks kind of, kind of Clark in the registry section, who happens to have a German wife, so therefore he's an expert on things German, uh, <laughs> to develop an assessment of German naval power, um, Sir Eric Crow. And he does this report on German naval capacity, and he says three things. He says, first, they say, that is protect their growing commercial capability. And they're a growing commercial power and they say that it's about protecting that trade. Second, it probably is. They probably mean it. That probably is what drives, you know, they know we have this huge commercial capacity in this huge Navy, they're having a growing commercial capacity, they want a Navy that's protected. That probably is what's driving them. And third, but what if it's not? Uh, and he says, this is a risk Britain cannot safely run. They could change their mind. We could be wrong in our assessment. They could be developing a capacity to challenge us. Uh, and so we have to outstrip the German investment in, in maritime capability. And that starts off the, you know, the dreadnoughts. And while we go to World War I. Sitting in debates in Washington in 2017, 2019, it was like living through the Crow Man memorandum being rewritten. Chinese say this is about protection of globalization. There's good reason to believe them. 70% of their economy is dependent on that trade, right? But what if it's not? Uh, can we take that risk? And you begin to see a deep shift in, in American naval thinking, in American strategic thinking towards a sense that we really have to be able to contain Chinese naval power uh, in, those, in those waters, right? It's not the only thing happening in US-China relations, obviously, in the strategic census is what's going on. I don't have to belabor this in this room, but in when I'm talking to broader public audiences about this stuff, uh, Chinese missile systems, our ballistic missile defense systems, et cetera. The point that I try to get across is we've all read our naval history. We've all read too many Patrick uh, O'Brien novels. I mean, we have an image of our mind of naval warfare, like a couple of ships out in the middle of the ocean exchanging gunfire at 300 paces or something. No, that is not <laughs> the modern naval warfare. Um, this is extremely high-tech warfare. Uh, these ships are essentially satellite, sonar, and uh, radar collection platforms tied into advanced missile systems, tied into ground-based bomb systems, etc. Same with Chinese. Chinese missile systems that hit our ships are both on those islands in those in those sand formations, but also about a thousand miles inland in, in China. Chinese anti-ship missiles are more sophisticated than anything in our arsenal. Um, this ship was the first ever to launch a ballistic missile to intercept uh, a missile, a ballistic missile designed to sink a ship. So it successfully intercepted it using what's called an SM6. Cost $200 million to do that test. Um, and, and as a colleague of mine, part of the defense point out, says, so what can stop this ship can carry about 30 such missiles. Again, most sophisticated ship in the American fleet. What would stop China from shooting 32 dummy <laughs> missiles at this and then shooting at the ship? Answer, nothing, okay. Um, dealing with that, we begin to develop what's called at the time air-sea battle doctrine. Every Department of Defense then got nervous that that was too rude to the Chinese and now it's called joint theater missile. I don't know, like Dr. Button 9 different variations and acronyms, but it's basically about using air power, integrated sea power to take out Chinese missile systems to allow us to continue to deploy naval power into South China Sea and East China Sea. <clears throat> the point that I try to get across here is that you go from a modest ship to ship clash someplace in these waters, for example, the Taiwan Strait. And it is exactly one turn of an escalation dial. 
before we're engaged in missile strikes and airstrikes a thousand miles inland in inland China uh, to take out the C4 SIR, to take out the capacity to launch these, launch these missiles. Uh, it's a remarkably unstable system that we're dealing with out there uh, in the Western Pacific. Um, we continue to invest in submarines. Our submarines are still vastly superior to sub Chinese submarines. It's why we had a very nice, uh, President, by the way, launched the office deal two days after I published the book. That was very helpful. <laughs> to, uh, um, but this huge investment in nuclear submarines. Chinese have adopted tactics that we had in the Cold War of using what are called nuclear barrages. They can't find our submarines. So if they believe that our submarines are leaving port and they can't, they won't be able to find them, they have the capacity to use nuclear barrages to uh, basically uh, dismantle our capacity to sail successfully through the Luzon Strait and into these near seas. Um, as far as I understand, the Department of Defense, we haven't decided whether a use of a Chinese nuclear device underwater constitutes a reason to engage in a nuclear strike on China. Um, but that's where the debate is. I tried to just emphasize it. This is not really front of news. It's not really front and center in our imagination. We are in a very tense uh, arms race at sea with China out in the Western Pacific uh, in real time. Okay? We're not the only people out there. Obviously, the Japanese, the Indians, the Russians, now the Brits are back. Every major power, which is they are, uh, are now sailing again in these waters uh, around control of the Western Pacific. I mentioned before, just to add a certain amount of drama, uh, is the issue of the Taiwan Strait, which connects the East China Sea and the South China Sea. And of course, as China develops the naval capacity to defend those waters, it is more or less the same naval capacity would need to mount an invasion uh, of, of Taiwan. So that gets also perhaps <coughs> questions of artifacts. I finished the book not on these issues. I decided to finish the book by turning to uh, oceanography, energy, climate change, all of which are hugely consequential, this for which the seas are hugely consequential. 90% of all the oil and gas burned, 90% of the excess heat uh, generated by the burning of oil and gas in the last several decades has been absorbed by the seas. The seas are the weather vein of our changing, uh, changing climate, changing weather patterns. Um, oceanography, hugely consequential to how we understand modern power, how we understand climate change, the role of the Navy, but I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go into a lot of that today. Uh, but happy to talk about it. We'll just emphasize this point. Um, uh, we think about sort of, I talked about before how sea-based globalization is different than our mental image of globalization. Energy flows, 80% uh, of all get oil in the world is either found at sea or moved by sea to its final port, and about 60% of natural gas. So net, we're, we've been around two thirds of the world's supply of oil and gas found at sea or moved by sea, trending towards about three quarters vastly consequential what's happening in cities. And in climate change, I wanted to end by climate change by hopefully having something a little bit more uplifting than you know nuclear arms races at sea with the Chinese. Um, I have to confess that as I look at the way that the warming waters are playing out in terms of what that's driving in short-term adaptation, and you play out the different scenarios, et cetera. Climate change is always written about final thought. Uh, climate change is always written about as this we're all in the same boat. But it doesn't, it looks that way if you take the kind of worst case projections out over 70, 80 years. Right? If you come much shorter in time, uh, this is playing out in very different ways in different waters. Right? Um, South China Sea, very shallow. Therefore, if it gets a little bit of heat, the temperatures go up a lot. Fish stocks collapsing precisely at the point when Asian economies are growing and need a lot of protein. Contrast that to the Arctic, uh, warming global average temperatures, melting of the Arctic sea ice, which is making the water colder, which is fantastically productive for fishing. Okay? The Arctic has emerged as just fantastically pro uh, proficient uh, fishing grounds. Right? So it's just an illustration of the very different ways that adaptation is playing out in the short terms. And as I write about in the book, what I see it driving is that are adding to uncertainty and adding to competition, not driving more collaborative uh, processes. Long story short, I end, and this takes us back to the kind of things we're dealing with in Russia and Ukraine right now. I end the book by noting that we are now living in a world where both our natural systems and our economic systems 
both deeply tied to the oceans, are hugely integrated, uh, as we all know, but that we are simultaneously operating a very tense, very active arms race in the same domain, with the same actors in these same waters. And there's just a fantastically uh, important contradiction between those realities. As I was writing this about six months ago, we're seeing it now in the case of Russia, right? Imposing sanctions, pull that cost to us. Nothing compared to the costs and consequences of trying to deal with China uh, in these waters, whether that was, if we, you know, if we think we had trade interruptions last year at LA Long Beach, wait until we're fighting a naval battle in the Taiwan Strait, right? Uh, let alone the globalization consequences that we tried to deal with. Uh, and so this deep contradiction between contemporary sea-based globalization on the one hand and the Chinese search for sea power, uh, China's return to the seas for the first time in 500 years, uh, which I think is essentially a tectonic change in geopolitics that will be led with for a long period of time. So let me end there. I'm happy to open up into any one of a number of different directions. Okay, excellent. Thank you, first of all, for that um... You know, I'm tired of talking about chaos and war, but I guess that's the world that we're in. <laughs> yeah, I didn't really cover, I didn't do much on democracy. We had, well, we had some votes. Cool <laughs> I liked those. Um, so I wanted to talk about like my family who lives in Taiwan. Anyway, so um, I will take names uh, of people who have questions. Um, and if we could please keep our questions short uh, out of respect yeah. for all of the questions that want to be asked, I would deeply appreciate it. Um, I will take the liberty of asking the first one, which is that uh, we already had been seeing a realignment of the political right in a lot of Western countries to be more protectionist and anti-trade, um, especially, you know, for example, in the Trump administration. And given the pandemic um, and also rising inflation fear, supply chain crises, there might be more political, uh, you know, appetite for decreasing reliance on global trade. How do you think that the domestic backlash of globalization, such as there is one in the West, yeah. would affect some of this? Um, and then I have a, a list that I need. You know, so I've been thinking about this a lot over the last couple of years, obviously writing about these things and watching this play out during the pandemic. And I mean, you know, think about the political implications of this country, the fact that our TVs now cost $50 more than they did two years ago, or, you know, gas is a little bit more expensive. Like this is not a society uh, geared up for absorbing huge quantities of costs. The cost of deglobalizing from China, I mean, we've been building this system for 50 to 60 years. 30% of our GDP, 50% of our profits are tied to this. Like, sure, we could keep, right? A fantastically con con costly enterprise. But if we don't address it, and we ended up in a shooting war in the Western Pacific, which is highly possible. Uh, the interruptions to global trade, the interruptions to flows, the interruptions to globalization, as I said, they're gonna make the Russia story look like a nothing, make coronavirus look like a nothing in terms of their implications to global supply chains. What I argue in the book is that you're, you're there faced with two choices. One, you just continue to kind of manage these two systems and hope to God you don't end up in a clash with them. It's kind of a hope, not a strategy. You could do a kind of Trump utter key, try to read, you know, but it seems to me like highly unlikely that we're gonna be successful in doing that. The cost would be vast. And the third option is to remake globalization away from China, uh, which in my mind has one option and one option only, which is India, okay? Um, I note in the book, I look at, you know, so looking at the world through trade figures and, and, and ports, <laughs> India, which is now the fifth largest economy in the world, uh, has not one single port in the top 25, right? And it's just an illustration of how much it is the case that India has not yet in real terms opened up to globalization. Were they to do so, the possibilities for low cost production and the remapping of, of global supply chains are pretty real. I mean, that's a decades long project, but at least it would be a project in the right kind of direction. And the fact, you know, just as I was publishing, we had the kind of first leader level meeting with the quad, uh, we've seen now uh, the UK and Japan and uh, sorry India and 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 the UK signed joint basing agreements for the Indian Ocean. UK and India uh, began negotiations on a free trade agreement a couple of months ago. Uh, you know, so maybe we're starting to see India move in that direction, and that would I think create opportunities. And not India alone, but India is really the only one at scale that could could change. So that, to my mind. I haven't written this article, but it seems to me that what we, we don't need a foreign policy for the American middle class. We need a foreign policy for the Indian middle class, um, both in terms of globalization and, by the way, also climate change. Um, so that would be my, 
Okay, so I have two questions. I'm going to be really fast and I'm going to talk fast, so it's going to take less time. Um, so um, they kind of contradict one another, so I'm interested in what your answer is. So, first of all, a couple of us in the room went on Carl Vincent, Scott, I think you. But, um, and so that's an aircraft carrier, and, and they were heading over here, we think, afterwards. So that's the aircraft carrier that, yeah. that killed Osama bin Laden. You know, they right. sent the special crew from there and then brought, then there's a spot on the deck purportedly Osama bin Laden that you're not supposed to look at, but then they can go for the Yeah, but don't look. Um, so, you know, we have aircraft carriers. We have, we have a dozen of them, a lot of them moving around at any one time. Um, China really doesn't, can't compete with that. Um, they're extraordinarily well armed. So you showed us a, what to me looks kind of like a frigate. Um, that is not as well armed, I would say, as Carl Vincent is in, in terms of taking on a Chinese Navy. So, can you comment on that? Because you left that, that aspect of our naval power out. We still stand a lot more, of course, and a much bigger military. And then, secondly, so on the one hand, it seems as though we can overpower them relatively easily, contradicting your narrative, perhaps. Um, but secondly, you know, can you also comment on the sort of force multiplier of China and Russia moving? Together at times, especially uh, with regard to the Arctic and the, and the shipping lanes that are opening as uh, ice breaks up, and Russia has all of those nuclear power, the most nuclear powered uh, uh, ships in the world. Those lanes. Yeah. Um, so I would say at this stage, the Navy's assessment is not that we could overpower the Chinese Navy, uh, combined Navy, Air Force, <laughs> Missile Force. Those missile systems that I talked about, the Chinese call them aircraft carrier killers. They've never been tested in battle, obviously, um, but our assessment is that they would successfully, you know, a few of them would successfully sink an aircraft carrier. That's why the John Paul Jones is <laughs> sailing beside it, trying to shoot down those missiles, right? Um, but an SM-6 costs $160 million or whatever, you know, that system is fantastically expensive. And my point about dummy missiles exhausting our defenses. Um, play this out in a range of scenarios, so I should have spent more time with this. So you play this out in a range of scenarios. Two frigates clash, or the Chinese make a maritime move on Taiwan. We engage the Seventh Fleet, pull parts of the Fifth Fleet back, etc. Um, uh, the Navy says that China's Navy is now larger than ours. I think that's you know measuring for congressional budget reasons. Uh, measured by firepower, I estimate that our Navy is about eight, five times larger than ours. <clears throat> but we're sailing six and a half thousand miles away from our rear supply base. They're sailing 80 miles away from their rear supply base. Okay, that's a pretty big geographical advantage. Um, the island formations in the South China Sea extend the range of their missiles, extend to the range of their fleet. The Navy at this stage does not believe that they can successfully operate aircraft carriers inside that red line, the first island chain. Okay, so this is a John Foster Dulles concept for containing the, the, the Russians and the Chinese in the First World War. So this is our bases in Japan. These are the Japanese Ryoko Islands. They have major defense assets along them, and that's Taiwan. We have basing rights in the Philippines, and then you come down here, you can't get out here. We have a base in Singapore. You don't call it a base, call it a logistic station. It's a base. All right, so we have naval assets all along these waters. The Navy does not believe we can successfully or safely anymore operate aircraft carriers within those waters. Right? Uh, so if we want to, to do something like defend Taiwan, we have to take out the Chinese missile systems. Chinese missile systems are there and there and there. Right? So this is where Earthy battle comes in. That's us moving using missile systems, using long range strike to push and using our submarines to push their fleet back a little bit, allowing our aircraft carriers to surge in, to get close enough in range to hit their bases and land. Uh, while we're doing cyber operations to take out C4 ISR, etc. So the, the, it, it, you know, I can go into a lot more detail, but the point I try to get across for a broader readership is like, this is war, right? We're at war with the Chinese PLA. This is not a limited naval clash. What happens in the Taiwan Strait does not stay in the Taiwan Strait. This is war, uh, full-scale systems war. China call it informatized war, we call it systems war, but this is full-scale battle in order to be able to operate uh, our air power in those waters at this stage. So um, the Chinese, the Russian amplification of it is not on the surface. The Chinese surface fleet is more sophisticated now than the Russian surface fleet. Chinese submarine fleet is more sophisticated than theirs. 
uh, not as sophisticated as ours. And, China, and Russia obviously has a network of ports and fueling stations and et cetera around the world that China does not yet have. And, I, and what, we, what we have seen is pretty extensive collaboration between the Chinese and the Russian navies, sometimes joined by Iran, how much that matters, uh, um, in, in collaboration. So it's, I do not think that at this juncture, Russia adds a huge amount of shooting power to the Chinese Navy, but they do add global logistics capability that if they were making them available to the Chinese PLAN would be, would be consequential. And so at this juncture, they have not done that, uh, but they could. I might start taking questions two at a time. Um, so I'll try to be briefer in my answers. Oh, okay. Um, so I had Steve Piper, and we'll just collect Steve. Steve <laughs> oh, okay, so then, and Eric. A great talk. Uh, let me ask this. Look at those lines, though. It seems to me that if the Chinese really want to protect the trade, they've got to go much further. Because I assume it's just a major crisis of shooting war. Stuff that gets out past the second island chain is heading towards the United States, probably not. They every get the ability to go through the Arctic along the northern route there. You know, that, that could be close from Alaska. Yeah. And then I think you know, along the Strait of Malacca, a place like that, you could probably close them off. So you see everybody the Chinese push out even further because right now, I would think that the, the US Navy and there's, I guess, the new concept of Marine Sat, which is sort of creating small detachments with anti ship missiles, yeah. along a whole bunch of islands there. Yeah. They could be pretty much bogged up for some reason. Right. Big debate. Um, I, oh, sorry, we're doing two. Yeah, yeah, sorry. A terrific book. I'm, I'm not only need to buy it, I will read it. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, just a quick comment. I used to, about years years ago, I was in house counsel for an international division of what became General Electric, but we did containerization. And the legal problems that come out of containerization from evictions in Algeria to, yeah. uh, uh, to uh, containers coming off of trucks and injuring people in New Orleans, and it was fascinating. Uh, but I, I was going to ask you a question about the role of Southeast Asia uh, in, in this, I, but I'm going to reframe it because are the Chinese infiltrating? They can do whatever they want in Cambodia. Uh, they've got a huge depot in, in Colombo, and I suspect they've got submarines uh, around uh, Sri Lanka. I, Talk about the infiltration of uh, uh, China and Southeast and South Asia. Yeah, okay. Um, they're connected here. Um, so there's a big debate in American naval circles about whether China is developing a global blue water capability for precisely that reason. I come down squarely on the side in the book, I come down squarely on the side of those who say yes, right? Um, one of the little evidence points, so, um, I start the, the strategic chapters of the book in a place called Param Island. Param Island is exactly three miles wide, two miles deep. It's barren uh, and has been controlled in its history by the Ottoman Mamluks, the Ottomans, the Mamluks, the Portuguese, the French, the Spanish, the British, and the Soviets. Okay. Why? Because it's in what's called the Bab el Manab, which is the entrance from the Indian Ocean to the Red Sea and then up into the Suez Canal. Right? It's also 18 miles away from Djibouti, where uh, the location south of Djibouti, where China opened its first overseas naval base. Right? So for me, if you're looking at leading indicators of imperial intention or hegemonic intention at the naval and sea power, trying to get a hold of, of Paramount is a pretty good one. Um, we've seen, I think the best work on this is done by, uh, I'm gonna forget his name, Erickson, Andrew Erickson at the, at the Naval War College, who writes about China developing what he calls strategic strong points, where they have invested in port facilities, rail networks, diplomatic relationships, and commercial investments that can very rapidly be flipped to bases should they choose, which is what they did in Djibouti. Uh, they appear to be on the verge of doing so in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, they have commercial assets in Greece, which are right across the waters from Russian bases in, in Syria. That's not accidental, I don't think. In other words, what we're seeing is the kind of equatorial Guinea I mentioned, we're seeing putting in place a, a network of capabilities that could be used to, to, to mount such global trade protection operations. Okay. Um, uh, we developed a global blue water naval capability during the Second World War and afterwards, in the course of the Second World 
obviously defeating the Japanese uh, and the Germans who were the two competitors at the time and uh, collaborating with the British who was still, we had the world's largest Navy, they had the largest global reach. And then afterwards inheriting, buying, boring, squeezing out of them several of their important assets, but with no actual competitors in our way as we developed the Blue Water Navy. China does not have that opportunity, right? It's really hard, it's really expensive, and there are a lot of people in their way. Um, uh, sail out through the Straits of Malacca, and the first thing you hit is the Bay of Bengal, and what I describe in the book is a thousand mile dagger in the heart of Chinese ambitions, namely India, right? India is now beginning to develop in a very significant way its naval infrastructure and basing in the Bay of Bengal as the first point of container of the Chinese Navy. Uh, you, you're right that they're also, they have a substantial scientific presence in the Arctic, obviously dual use. Uh, the Russians have, uh, have increased the size of their base in the Arctic. There's a lot of collaboration there. Um, so I do think we are watching China's effort to build a global naval capability, partly for reasons of trade protection. You know, the same reason the British did it under these Indian companies, same reason we did it. But I make the point in the book that I think we can at best describe that as a counter hegemonic capability, not a hegemonic capability. And they, they can't displace us from the seas. They're a long way from being able to displace us from the seas. But they can start to make our life more difficult and more costly in a bunch of these, a bunch of these waters. Um, Southeast Asia is part of that. But honestly, um, uh, you know, you just look at the geography here. So they have Cambodia, they have the big thing that they're trying to do, well, not trying, they are doing is building a base here, right? Uh, linked to rail lines across the Burmese highlands. Slight problem that Burma's at war. Um, you know, a little bit of a complication for their strategy, but this is their main play to get around the Malacca Strait uh, is across that Burmese water. Then, but then again, you know, so India's building all these bases here in the Bay of Bengal. Um, so, Penetration of Southeast Asia is significant in all sorts of terms, but in terms of the kind of naval play and the trade play, it's really their main issue is to get past this blockage that we still more or less entirely control. Um, you know, Bridge Colby's book is all about those Marines, the missiles, which are in containers, by the way, uh, building up our capacity to fight the Chinese inside these waters. Uh, it seems to me that we should at very least have a good eye on what they're doing beyond these waters as well, if they're in Equatorial Guinea and wherever else they are. Um, quick anecdote, Djibouti. I was sitting in my office in, in, in Brookings and the Djiboutian ambassador comes to see me. This is 2017, it's a guy I know from the UN. He says, Bruce, I need your help. I'm like what? I was like, I need to talk to some people in the State Department who don't work for African Division. I'm like why? It's like, because we're trying to sell our port IMF was squeezed us. We have to repay the debt. We're trying to sell a port. Abu Dhabi wants to buy it. Uh, but the Chinese came to me and said, if I don't sell our, our port to them, they're going to squeeze our debt. And I'm going to have to sell the port to the Chinese. And I need help. I need somebody to pay attention. I can't get anybody in Africa. Everybody in the African department doesn't know anything about China. And I can't get anybody in the China department to pay attention. So I made a few phone calls, tried to get somebody to take this call. And we took this call. Lo and behold, China has a port in the Red Sea. Uh, right. Good job. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> One of my high impact moments, right? <laughs> uh, but it was just illustrative of, you know, so when the news broke that they were about to develop this port in Equatorial Guinea, John Finer flew out there to try to talk them out of it. it was the first visit by anybody above the level of director from the United States to Equatorial Guinea in 32 years. What are the odds that they're going to go along, right? Uh, so neglecting what China is doing at a global level, I think is pretty consequential uh, in terms of both the, there's all sorts of reasons why it's consequential, but in, in these ones as well. All right, I have Marissa, Brett, and Marcel. Is there anyone else I missed who wanted to ask a question? All right, look at Johannes. So we'll do Marissa and then Brett, pause, and then end with Marcel and Johannes. So if you could be quick in your questions, please. Thanks. I have a different type of question, but I just can't help but ask. Could you explain why these ships, like, so when the ship got stuck in the canal, yeah. it was Japanese owned, some flag yep. from this. Why is it that the shipping company or shipping industry has that complicated network of flags and ownership yeah. in Britain? 
Oh, but that is now the question you were. Okay, all right. <laughs> right. Okay. All right, so I have, I have two questions, and, and I promise I will ask them both quickly. I want to say um, just how much I enjoyed your presentation, and that I've just put your book in my, my Amazon shopping cart. If I Excellent. Can find it. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And you're going to read it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because there is a <laughs> astounding <laughs> distinction between. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, all right. So, so first question. I, I guess I was. I'm curious, kind of. Um, you know, at some point there was kind of a, a shift between within um, kind of the Chinese shipping industry about kind of the concentration of sort of containerization within Hong Kong and kind of the transition to the mainland, right? And so I'm kind of curious, um, kind of understanding to understand more about kind of how that transition can kind have of changed the domestic politics of, of the CCP, and to what extent that might help us understand. Um, the extent to which you know, the CCP appears to have been kind of more willing to sort of undermine um, economic institutions and other than you know, Hong Kong's um, growth for, for a long time. So I'd just like to kind of know more about kind of the um, implications of that transition. The second question um, focuses more on, on the military base in the you know, um, So, you know, the, the first base, you know, in Djibouti, you know, it's clearly you know, laden kind of shipping lines, you know, Akutua Guinea, you know, there are, I guess, kind of two standard explanations. One is about um, sort of, you know, commodities, uh, in particular oil from South Africa, Equatorial Guinea, you know, Congo, Angola, you know, et cetera. Um, and then you know, maybe even a power projection kind of capability you know, across the Atlantic. Given kind of the, the lack of sort of, you know, kind of shipping um, kind of volume that you display on the continent, I mean, uh, you know, I guess like my suspicion is, is that the Equatorial Guinea base is actually as much, if not more, about um, protecting uh, Chinese political interests, popping up governments in Central Africa in the way that the French government long has. I guess I'm kind of curious to what extent, um, kind of how you read the Chinese expansion of the Sacramento Guinea, which, which I really think of as potentially among the most um, important shifts in the future of you know, the Chinese Okay. Um, ownership. Yeah. Uh, the three largest. Ship owning countries in the world are Liberia, uh, Mauritania, and I can't remember, They're like trivial tiny countries, right? Who clearly are not actually the owners of these ships. Um, they're flags of convenience. It's a strange legal regime. We own the legal system to assign flags of convenience. So it's one of these sort of weird international regimes. It's actually just an American regime dressed up as an international regime largely designed us to escape international law, um, right? Uh, so yeah, so you'll be on a ship. Uh, the ship will have been made in Korea. It's owned by a Danish firm, but they've leased it through a Taiwanese-based ship leasing agency. This crew is Swiss, Ukrainian, Russian, German, Polish, Indian, Bangladeshi, and you know whatever else. A couple of Brits still there every now and again. Uh, you're docking down. When I showed you those Yangshan ports, the cranes are owned by Denmark. The ships are owned by some incredibly complicated. Right? Uh, and you mentioned this, just like endless complexity. So you know, on the ship that I was sailing on, there were 217 different insurance uh, sort of binders, right? Governing the management of that cargo, who owns what in the case of an accident, insanely complicated. And all essentially boils down to it's completely unregulated, right? For all intents and purposes, it's unregulated. The only thing that really regulates this is um, uh, the essentially monopolistic position of Lloyd's of London. Okay, so if Lloyd's of London says, this insurance regime no longer holds for your ship or this sea is a war risk entity, everybody in the industry follows. So they have sort of monopolistic power on the insurance, uh, hugely consequential. Everything else is just a sea of confusion and, and competing regulations and stuff, which the IMO pretends to have ownership of. Doesn't mean slide, so. um, I'd have to do more to get sure why it emerged that way, but it's a, you know, it's, it's completely bizarre. Um, and by the way, uh, when we watch container ships sailing out of the Baltic Sea, not being able to dock in London because of sanctions, I mean, who knows how many countries have stuff in those boxes? Who knows how many countries have a stake in the ownership of that ship, right? We're not just sanctioning the Russians, we're sanctioning, 
And by the way, you know, we, we touched briefly on Taiwan. Um, one of the things that I liked in doing the book was watching the interplay between trade and strategic issues. And right? so in the in naval circles, people will say, well, what if the Chinese just blockade Taiwan? That's the easiest way that they could invade, et cetera. Like, sure, you can blockade Taiwan. Taiwan's our eighth largest trading partner. It has crucial roles in global supply chains. So you blockade Taiwan, you're blocking the United States, you're blockading India, Germany, you know, whatever. You're not global trade doesn't work where you can just blockade some ship and it's a, you know, it's just got wheat headed for England. I mean, it's all global supply chains move now on ship, any kind of blockade like that, and it's going to ripple through the global economy in, in unpredictable and unmanageable ways, I think. Um, Ship from Hong Kong to the mainland. Look, it's not like they don't. I mean, this Hong Kong is still a very major port for that, right? I think it's the sixth largest port in the world. Um, they developed these other ones. Uh, basically, what they've done is they've put, well, there's three port complexes. There's a port complex out of Beijing, um, the smallest of their economic zones. There's a series of ports um, sort of north and south of Shanghai going out into the, uh, into the East China Sea. And then Guangzhou and Hong Kong uh, is, the, is the third, right? So in each of their major, three major economic zones, they have a port network. I don't think there was any kind of particular strategy around it other than just the secular process of as Shanghai has developed financially and as a port, uh, the, the weight has flown in that direction. That's where the hub is economically. And so it's simply reduced the importance of Hong Kong is, I mean, it's still important, but the relative importance of Hong Kong, I don't, I mean, I could be wrong and there could be deliberativeness behind that, but I don't, I don't see that from this. It just seems to be a kind of secular process. Um, but germane in that when they passed the national security law in Hong Kong with all the consequences, it seems to me that 10 years ago, they couldn't have done it um, because Hong Kong's weight in trade finance was simply too high. But that's really being displaced by Shanghai and the building of that, of that capability in Shanghai and, and Yangshan. On Equatorial Guinea, the announcement came after I published, so I don't know the answer. <laughs> Look, yeah, it's not like there are huge trade volumes flowing out of that. Um, I think in a lot of these things, there are, you know, when you find there are multiple possible explanations for the same move, it's usually the case that they're all true. Right? They have substantial, they invested in Equatorial Guinea for oil and commodities exports 10, 15 years ago. It's a major play. They don't have that scale of investment everywhere over the, those regions. There are parts of that region that we have still sort of substantial ties to the French, the whatever. So I think it's kind of opportunity, right? That's where they have weight. They want to protect their interests there, et cetera. But it does give them uh, a port on the Atlantic, which they're not going to find all that many other places. So uh, I don't have a deep explanation, but my guess is that kind of all of the above. All right. Final question for our last five minutes. Yeah. Um, Marcel and then Johannes. Right, so um, you started by saying that everybody benefits from globalization, from the ships and all that we talked about. But if you see global good, also need that global good requires global governance. You talk about that. The role of international law, the role of working. Why don't we set up a, a body that that could be police to use pollution and the use of these major maritime? Places. Um, so it looks like basically, so far we've relied on the hegemon, only one group of countries basically doing the policing, and, and when they go on the police, they can embark on the country they want to, like Korea. So, and now we see that we move into another, another system. So we need a new government for that system where there are multiple elements. Competing for, for you know, at least defense, defense rights over, over their interests uh, in, in the crisis. Yeah. So, like yeah. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation. And um, I, I have a question. Yesterday, we had another uh, video conference here on, on the issue of public finance in, in China and the demographic development. And, and I'm, I'm, I would like to relate that to one another because we are talking here about strategic long term questions. And, and, and the uh, conclusion, I think, of, of, of the guy who gave this presentation, uh, um, uh, uh, Carl Walter, you know, I think, was, was, was pretty negative. I mean, a, a dramatic, he, he says that, that the, the most recent um, demographic analysis for China is even much worse than for, for Japan. And, and, and the, the situation on public finance is, is also, without going into details, um, a number of question marks at least. So, and what we all know from, from history is uh, 
uh, to do something what we have described here to develop that you need an economic basis and you need a certain kind of, of stability in, in, in the kind of population and, and uh, did you look into your book or to your research a little bit about the link between these factors uh, is, is that relevant or yeah. how do you see that good so a couple of thoughts on this um and so what i at the end of the book i write about this and i look at the huge combined stakes and we all have huge stakes in the maintenance of globalization in the long-term climate change energy flow etc yeah you could certainly say it had enlightened leadership in both places figure out a way to you know co-patrol at sea right um india could patrol the indian ocean we could do the pacific you know whatever we could divide and conquer Maybe we all join forces protecting the flow of oil out of the out of the Persian Gulf. You're perfectly logical, right? Um, all we have to do is trust one another. And there you have the answer. Right? Um, and 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 as I as I said briefly, I actually watched this moment, 2005, 2006, 2007, 8, where we were co-patrolling at sea on counter piracy, where there was this sense of like maybe the shared interest in globalization is enough to tamp down the more natural tendency to strategic distress, et cetera, and just didn't last. Um, now that doesn't mean it couldn't be put in place. Sorry about that. Um, Can everyone keep their phones off, please? Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I sort of hint at the possibility of, you know, you could imagine sort of multinational arrangements at sea, you could imagine, right? So if, if we had done that in a deeper way in the 2006, 2007, 2008 period, maybe uh, that could have held. Honestly, I think China's sense of the opportunity to shake off uh, their dependence on us was, was probably always gonna override that, but you know, we might've tried deeper than tried to extend those counter piracy arrangements into code protection arrangements of some type. Um, uh, but in any case, that was a, a dog that didn't hunt, uh, use that phrase. Uh, and I think at this stage, the, the sense of strategic implications of this are so substantial, tied up in long-range missile strike, tied up now in nuclear strike, tied up in a whole range of things which have not been historically subject to global governance, but rather to arms races and the like. So unfortunately, I'm not, I don't end up very optimistic about that uh, notion in the book. And the demographics and the public finance and you know sort of becomes this debate you, you watch this and certainly in washington um and there are different people who argue this in different ways so hal brands had this piece in foreign affairs a little while ago arguing this is our most dangerous decade because 10 years out as china begins to sort of you know shed population and slow down they know that's coming therefore they have their maximum muscle here frankly i don't buy that um it seems to me that you know they could slow a good amount from where they are, uh, and they would still be in the shape to take out our navy in the Western Pacific for some time to come. Um, uh, they are building naval assets at a faster rate than anybody has done it since we did it after Pearl Harbor. Uh, the technological innovation is extraordinarily sophisticated. I mentioned that their missiles at this stage are more sophisticated than anything in our arsenal. Their recent test, we all saw this, the hypersonic um, uh, fractional orbital bombardment system. We've tested and failed to successfully uh, uh, deploy such a weapon. It's, you know, so you could, you don't have to project huge growth in their capacity for them to be able to be a serious challenge to us on the high seas. You could project out, you know, 25% reduction in the pace of growth. And that still be a very significant factor for us over a, a good long period of time. So I think it's, uh, I, I don't think we should get too optimistic about the decline in their capability to, to begin to slow a little bit economically or in demographic terms. I don't see it. You know, these things are always there in history, but it's not one for one and there are lags and they're already investing a great deal. Uh, so I think they are, they as a competitive naval power are with us for, you know, for the foreseeable future. All right, and on that note, thank you so much, Bruce. Thank yeah. you.